only see you when you pop up on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> but it's always the side. Side profile. Who's over here? I have a perfect view of Katie. Who's at the end? City attorney. Let's find out our secret instance. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's City Council work session uh, for Wednesday, January 25th on the budget. Um, I know that there was a meeting that just ended, so we're going to have Councilor Denton here shortly. Um, going to pass it over to the city manager um, to walk through the schedule um, and then over to Judy for some budget forecasting. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to the council. Thank you to uh, my colleagues who are here tonight. We are pleased to present what we know to be uh, in the picture for the FY24 budget. Uh, as we know it today, we know that will change, but we're happy to walk through with you what we know today. And this will be our agenda. It's similar to how we, we covered these topics this time last year. We'll go through the schedule first so people have a sense of expectations. And then Judy will jump into the forecasting itself, and then we'll leave time for discussion by council, and then always public comment. So when we sought to build this year's budget, we reflected on the goals that had been compiled by this council, which did not exist at this time last year, if you'll recall. So these are now the goals um, that are updated, that have, were created by you, that we, um, through which, you know, we, th we run all of our uh, operations and our requests through the, through the lens of these goals. And the budget schedule is as follows. Tonight we're at the work session. Uh, at, next, at the next regular council meeting, which is February 6th, we will hold the public hearing on the CIP. It will not be the long presentation that you saw at the work session. That presentation is available on our website, um, and we will be there to answer questions and hear from you in, in greater detail on that. Then uh, of note, the Fire Commission will hold this public hearing on Valentine's Day. Wow, that's, that's Valentine's Day. Um, <laughs> as well as the school board, I guess with some of us aren't going to celebrate Valentine's Day. And, uh, and then lastly, the Police Commission will meet on Wednesday, February 15th. Moving into March, we look to adopt the CIP because, as you know, the CIP, as adopted in March, that then gets incorporated into the budget. March is also when we will complete um, the department head conversations, get to work on putting the budget to print. And on May 1st, we will have that document to you. On May 8th, we will have the, public, the first public hearing on the budget. And then, per your request, we're going to have a Super Monday work session for all of the departments will, uh, and in order to be determined, make your, their presentations and we'll have one big gigantic budget review and listening session. We think in the, in the same way that you held, uh, requested last year, we'll have a public dialogue session on Thursday, May 18th, and we'll do it again, I think, with your approval in three different locations, trying to cover different time frames. I know um, Councilor Moreau and I will have planning board that night, but we'll figure it all out. And then we will have a budget wrap-up work session on Monday, May 22nd, with hopes in adopting the budget on June 5th. So that's the schedule. It's also on our website. I know it's a lot. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Judy. And if it's amenable to you all, I think questions at the end would be preferred. But um, mm -hmm. we'll leave that to you. So Judy, thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, Today we're just going to walk through, start with the FY23 uh, final budget and then uh, turn into the long-term financial planning tools because this is a really important aspect of how we build our budget. And then we'll talk about some of the impacts and highlights that we see in forecasting uh, currently for FY24. So we'll begin with the FY23 budget. And um, as it was adopted on June 5th of 2022, it was just under $132 million, $131.7 million. And when we prepare the budget, of course, we don't have our tax rate. So we estimate our tax rate at that time. There are a number of factors that go into uh, state revenues, the rooms and meals, the highway block grant. Um, that we that are unknown in the county tax that are unknown at the time that we're preparing our budget. Um, we did have um, uh, local revenues of $23 million, state revenues of 7.4 that we were anticipating, and then the use of fund balance of $2.8 million. And I'm going to talk more um, in detail on the use of fund balance later in this presentation. But as a result, 
Um, as I go to the state to set the tax rate, I'm going with these numbers right here. And the tax levy is basically the number, uh, the dollars that we must collect from the, uh, all the properties in Portsmouth to fund all the services that we uh, have in the general fund. So when we went, when we were preparing the budget, we estimated the tax rate to be $15.30, which is a $0.27 cent increase over the prior year. Um, when I went to the state and filed all the necessary reports, we did get final numbers um, for the adequate education and uh, a one-time revenue for the retirement employee contribution, which was um, the adequate education, which is the next slide, was, was higher than we anticipated. And so with all the adjustments that took place during the tax rate setting, we were able to reduce that estimated tax rate down by 10 cents. So the final tax rate of $20, uh, $15.20 was an increase of 17 cents per thousand over fiscal year 22. So I wanted to, uh, to focus on the one-time revenues, and we talked a lot about this when we were preparing the FY23 budget. Um, the adequate education grant, again, um, we anticipated 3.1. We actually received $3.285 million. <coughs> and again, this is one time. So we're not going to see um, this revenue uh, moving forward in FY24. And then on the retirement contribution uh, reimbursement, we received a little bit less than we expected, but the two combined of $3.9 million really equates to 61 cents on that tax rate. So that was your savings for uh, fiscal year 24. And we'll also talk about retirement um, later in this presentation going forward. So um, once the budget is adopted, anything uh, that comes after that, uh, any adjustments to that budget would be a, require a supplemental appropriation. <coughs> the final budget adoption, we had two supplemental appropriations, one for the DSA settlement for 500,000, and then we had a, a recent supplemental appropriation for the McIntyre design and engineering of 150. So that amends your budget. So this is the final legal um, a budget for FY23, and it's $132.4 million. So as we talk, as we prepare and start working on the budget, you know, one of the one of the most important things is really not to focus on one year at a time. That makes it difficult when we had the one-time revenue source because we were kind of forced into you know, having that affect the one year and not be able to spread it out over over time. But the, but our main focus on our financial forecast is really to, to, to eliminate any spikes or large increases or decreases in any given year. And, and so we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about some of those financial tools that help us along that line. Next slide. So we have a number of policies that assist with stabilizing costs. These policies were put into place, you know, several, a uh, couple of decades ago and really has put Portsmouth in a very uh, strong financial position over a, a number of years. And we incorporate um, this approach we and we carry over for several years. Uh, these policies has also placed Portsmouth ahead of other communities, helped us get through COVID-19. Um, and so we want to continue uh, this long-term planning. And I'll, we'll go over some of those policies as we move forward. So uh, what is fund balance? And I want to start with this, because I think that it's confusing um, to some, but in, um, when we talk about fund balance, it's a term, it's a governmental reporting term for the general government on a modified basis of accounting using current financial sources. So what, what does that mean? We look at a balance sheet, assets, liabilities, and fund balance. And if you look at the, the uh, fund balance sheet, it's all on a current financial resource, which means we're not reporting any capital assets, such as land or buildings, or we're not reporting any long-term liabilities, such as debt service and any other long-term liability. So fund balance is a term that we use. There's 
five components of fund balance. And what we really focus on is our committed fund balance and our unassigned fund balance. So the unassigned fund balance was an ordinance that was, um, well, the policy actually was established many years ago and it was amended in 2013 to say that we want to annually maintain an unassigned fund balance between 10 and 17 percent of the appropriations. Unassigned fund balance is your area where it's not designated for any specific purpose. Um, and this is where mostly when you do supplemental appropriations or we use to offset the tax rate, we take it from unassigned fund balance. So at the end of June 30th of 2022, we just had our audit presentation and our unassigned fund balance uh, was just over $17 million or 13.57% of appropriations. As you can see um, from this chart here from fiscal year 16 through 22, we pretty much remained in that area and remained pretty consistent, which is um, very favorable to our rating agencies. And then total fund balance combined with the total of those five components of fund balance as a whole. This is also looked at by Standard & Poor's and the good measurement tool to use here is to remain over 30% um, in any given year. That's, a, that's a, also a very favorable position to be in. So at the end um, of 22, it was 39.7, um, I think my chart is a little off on that one, but I should say 22 but it was 39.7% um, of appropriations. So now we'll talk about the use of fund balance. So um, the use of fund balance can take place during the budget process. As you're deliberating um, the budget, we typically use uh, some of our reserves to offset the tax rate. And then um, any supplemental appropriations beyond that would also uh, take in consideration the use of fund balance here. Um, as you can see, uh, every year we utilize fund balance and, what, and how we replenish it is surpluses from the prior year. When we close the year, if there's a surplus, that surplus folds back into fund balance and then it's utilized in the next year to offset the taxes so it benefits the taxpayer. Um, as you can see in FY22, we used nearly $5.7 million and um, in FY23, $3.4 million. And the next slide actually um, itemizes those uses of fund balance. So um, if we didn't use this fund balance, for instance, in FY22, 5.6, this would just be added onto that tax levy. And then that would be distributed through the tax rate and collected. So, so we are always rotating out the use of fund balance surplus gets closed back into some of those reserves and the unassigned fund balance so that we can use it to keep the tax rate as stable and um, as possible going forward. Now we have the two supplemental appropriations um, that I talked about earlier. And so we ended the year in FY22 with 13.57. Uh, we use 650,000. It drops the unassigned fund balance down a little bit, but you know we're probably anticipating some surplus at the end of FY23, and we'll be able to uh, replenish that. So now moving on to the Leave It term Termination Stabilization Fund. This this policy has been in place um, for a number of years, and what this was was um, earlier back in. Uh, prior to 1996 that all employees were able to accumulate sick leave and cash that sick leave out upon termination. So um, this caused significant spikes and valleys and unpredictable budgets within the departments because also the individual departments had to know who was retiring in that particular year, who was leaving, and then their budgets would be um, dramatically reflected in, in spikes to have to budget that um, year, you know, year of year. You could have three people leaving in one year, no one leaving in the next two years. So in order to be stable here and to help mitigate those um, large hits in any one particular year, there was a couple of things that happened. One was during negotiations of all the labor agreements that any new employee coming aboard um, after 1996 no longer could cash in that sick leave. So one, that, that reduces that long-term liability. 
and the accumulation of that liability just getting larger and larger over time. And then the creation of the leave of termination uh, fund um, was established so that we did an actuarial study and we determined over a long period of time what we would need um, in the future to pay this liability. And we have the departments just uh, fund a certain amount, um, pretty level for the most part, and we had adjusted over time. Um, but that would help offset that um, spikes in value and keep the budget uh, easy to maintain. This chart here shows general government, school, police, and fire each individual. So the orange line represents the budget amount in those departments from each year. And then the blue line represents the actual paid out amount for leave um, in reference to those departments. So as you can see, the blue, this spikes. So if you had to budget that annually within your budget, that would um, be very unpredictable and really hard to manage. Um, the next slide actually it tells you uh, pretty much where we're at now. So um, over time, it has been dramatically reduced uh, through um, tuition. And so if you uh, look at the table on the right-hand side, the, um, the total amount of employees now is on the general fund side only is down to 56 employees out of all employees. So we're at 7.86% of eligible employees. This fund will not go away because we still use this fund to um, pay out for vacation upon termination. And so it will continue, but we'll see that it's really dwindling down. Um, I anticipate that we will probably use the same appropriation number um, from FY22 to FY that we use in FY23 and probably moving forward in FY24. So the next slide shows the liability as of June 30th, and I think this is pretty interesting. So back in 2000 when we pretty much implemented this policy, um, the liability just for the general fund was at $7.6 million, and this is when we implemented it. So you know, um, so we still had employees accumulating time, and um, as you can see in 2002, it's still growing. It was over $10 million, and then as people leave, you can see that that liability is, is dwindling down. So at the close of fiscal year 22 is $4.4 million for the general fund. So it's working. <laughs> Uh, the next stabilization policy is the health insurance. This is very similar to leave it term. The spikes and valleys in health in health premiums is very unpredictable. Um, we had set aside a policy to use a 10-year rolling average of the premiums and then increase the budget for the departments by, uh, by that 10-year average. This is an area where um, the city manager and I have had lots of conversations. I think this is an area where we really need to do some um, maybe different approach to this policy. It has become very skewed um, over time because we were going off a budget from year to year to year. And the number of FTEs that are in place or the changes in families to um, plans and, and vacancies, it can all kind of skew that number. Um, but this is just talking about the policy today. Health Trust gave us a guaranteed maximum rate of 3.6%, but that 10 year average is 2.1%. Uh, so if we ask the de departments to budget the 2.1%, we're automatically underfunding the current year. Um, the school department's school care. Um, came in at 3.5%, but that 10-year average is 5.3. But if you look at the table down below, um, where, where the proposed um, estimated city cost, and we include all vacancies at this point, is uh, about $15.6 million. But using this policy, the 10-year rolling average, we're budgeting 13.9. So if uh, all these positions were uh, filled and policies and premiums were the same, we'd be short about $1.7 million, which we would use from the stabilization fund. So what we're going to look at that a little bit more closely going forward. Um, one of the things that helped us sustain this fund 
um, was the holiday premiums. We talked about holiday premiums last year, and this essentially was a reimbursement from the health trust. It was a law that was set back in, in fiscal year 12 that um, stated that they could not, that the health trust and school care could not keep um, a high surplus more than their capital um, adequacy reserve target. So they, they maintain a certain amount in their net position for their capital adequate reserve. And if their surplus goes higher than that, then they have to refund that. We've already got notification uh, from health trusts that, they, that the way that their adequate uh, capital adequacy reserve is, that we will not receive any refund in FY24. We had received refunds in the past because COVID, there was one year we received over a million dollars. Um, but going forward, um, that's going to really start to dwindle down and go away. Another reason to look at policy and how we handle the health insurance stabilization fund. <clears throat> uh, moving along, the cost of living adjustments. So here's um, a table, excuse me, of the 16 collective bargaining agreements. <clears throat> um, we have ratified a lot of the contracts, but we still have um, contracts that are highlighted uh, in TAN that will expire on June 30th of, of 23. And we have um, still cafeteria and custodials that are still behind a little bit. And um, so going forward and putting our budget together for 24, we'll probably be uh, trying to estimate some collective bargaining contingency. The 10 year rolling average in the contract um, is 2.55%. There's a little history table on what the actual um, November to November, we use the Boston, uh, Cambridge, Newton, Mass, New Hampshire um, uh, CPI, and that came in at 7% for November. 10 year rolling average is 2.55. Um, as you note here, Social Security for calendar year 23 is 8%. Uh, most of the contracts that have been ratified for FY24 has a floor of 3% and a ceiling of 5%. So we'll be utilizing that and uh, preparing our uh, estimates for salaries. So now the New Hampshire retirement, they set their biennium budget and they set their rates uh, for a two year period. So that changes fiscal year 24 and 25. Now how uh, the pension is funded is in three ways. It's the employee contribution, the employer contribution, and their investment income. And that's what funds the pension. Now we had um, what took place in consideration in establishing these rates. As you can see, the rates had dropped for 24 and 25. And that is because the New Hampshire retirement system realized a 29.4% return on investments in their fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021, which is the year that they used to establish those two rates. Now they've since lost um, some uh, investments going forward, but they're kind of locked into these rates for 24 and 25. So this will also help in preparing the budget uh, uh, for fiscal year 24. Now, this is a, um, Conversation that's been taking place on, on the loss of state contributions, trying to bring back some contributions from the state. But um, we always had received prior to uh, fiscal year 10, 35% of the employer contributions for uh, just for teachers, police, and fire personnel. And then they reduced that. They reduced that obligation to 30% fiscal year 10, to 25% fiscal year 11, and then 0% fiscal year 12. And so we haven't received any up until this uh, fiscal year 23 where we receive that one time uh, reimbursement of seven and a half percent. There um, is a bill, uh, House Bill 50, that is asking um, if that passes would restore the 7.5 percent state share of the employer cost for the police, teacher, and fire personnel. Um, this would change the rates. It would not be, if it goes through, it would not be a, one, a revenue source that we used in fiscal year 23, preparing a budget. Um, going forward, preparing this budget, we can't count on that. We won't have any expectation or know anything probably till, till June. So we'll prepare the budget with what we do know and the rates that we have. So talking about the New Hampshire retirement system and um, this unfunded liability piece, which has, has come up in the past, um, 
there is this huge unfunded liability that was that was known back in uh, 2009. Uh, the New Hampshire Retirement System established a 30-year plan to pay down this unfunded liability piece. Um, and part of what happened in fiscal year 15 is that there was a GASB pronouncement that said to all governmental entities that you now have to put this liability piece onto your uh, government-wide financial statements. So this impacted our, our financial statements. You can see there's a row um, that said in, in FY15, $68 million. Um, FY22 is we're at $87 million. And um, the highlighted um, assumed rate of return changed. Um, and when that changes, that also changes our liability. And the assumed rate of return is adopted by the New Hampshire Retirement um, System Board of Trustees. And the unfunded liability is calculated and provided to the members of the New Hampshire Retirement System. So that number that's in this line is calculated by the New Hampshire Retirement System. We're told what to put on our financial statements. So, um, and it is a plan, I think we're in year 14, uh, 24 would be 15, um, to, to redu reduce that. There's also another House bill on the table, um, HB 555, and this would require the state to transfer 75% of their biennium surplus to the New Hampshire retirement system to reduce the retirement system's unfunded liability which in return would reduce future employer contributions. So again, that's a House bill that's just on the table now and we won't have any um, information on that for some time. But what happens with this unfunded liability, and this is why I wanna bring this up. So we're paying these contribu the employer contribution rates and the table on the left shows a 15 year retirement rate from FY9 to 24. And as, you, as shown in this table, um, over that time, the total increase, say for teachers, went up 239%. Police went up 164%. So this is a big, this is a big um, cost. And the table to the right breaks down what those rates in the employer's contribution goes to. The, the column that is gray is the percentage of the rate of, uh, that goes to the unfunded liability piece. So for example, um, if we look at the fire department, their new rate is 30.35%. So 77.4% of that rate just goes to the unfunded liability piece. 6.28% goes to their normal cost pension plan. So theoret theoretically, at the end of this 30 year, or if this House Bill 555 would help, these rates are supposed to go down in the future. So next is workers' compensation that we're looking at for FY24. The overall cap rate increase was 8%. Um, breaking this down into all of the funds in the departments, it, it, it is an increase of 10.8 to the general fund. Now these rates are established by Primex and they vary depending on the experience and the number of claims um, from our employees that go through, uh, through Primex. So this is the, the dollars that they were, that were asked to uh, increase by. So, looking at the operating budget and looking at the departments. Now, um, we don't have sound numbers for you tonight in these particular areas. We do have um, highlights of what is going to impact the FY24 budget. Um, starting with the general government, and um, we have uh, salaries and COLA adjustments, and also step increases. And we have delayed hires that were in fiscal year 23. And any kind of time we do delayed hires, and this is the same for the police department, that impacts your next year's budget because we, we cut you know, uh, halfway through the year um, in the FY23 budget, but now we get to fund those positions in a full year. So that will have an impact on them. There's also other departmental needs and FTE increases. 
um, inf information technology. As you know, we've been really uh, ramping up the IT department and the needs that we have for our uh, safeguarding our, our systems. Uh, planning, legal, recreation, and the finance department will all have requests. And then contractual services uh, increase uh, increases there. The police department, uh, again, they do not have um, contracts going forward for their uh, police personnel, uh, but they will have step increases. Um, and also they're delayed hired. There is a crime analyst and two sworn officers that were delayed. And then they're, they're hoping to uh, discuss the social worker, uh, FTE, and reinstating the dispatcher position. The mandated training, uh, this was mandated by Governor Sununu's executive order um, that required a total of 24 hours per officer um, for this special training. This was spread out over three years um, to, to reduce the impact to any particular one year in the budget. Software maintenance increase, and then a new initiative is the mental health and wellness program for officers. So that will be an impact to FY24. The school department, um, again, has increases in special education tuition and student transportation. They also have COLA and step increases associated with their budget. They've already released their budget, um, and their, uh, their proposed starting point here is at 3.99% increase. The fire department um, is uh, pretty bare boned. Um, they're, they're moving forward with the FY24 budget, basically under 1% increase. Um, they also, you know, they do not have their contracts for their fire personnel. So, again, that will be in collective bargaining. So moving on to um, non-operating is our debt service. We've had lots of conversations through the CIP process. So you've seen this chart. Um, the city's policy is to use no more than 10% of the annual appropriation towards the net debt service payments to keep debt manageable. Very um, posit positive and favorable plan um, that is uh, highly looked at by your rating agencies and it helps with uh, smoothing out the budgets from year to year. Capital outlay, also in uh, the CIP. So in this policy really is to use um, no more than 2% of the prior year's appropriation for capital outlay. Capital outlay is your, is your pay as you go for your, for your capital projects. Um, this appropriation of 1.92 million is about 1.45% of the 23 budget. Uh, there's a note on the bottom that during FY23 uh, budget deliberations, $405,600 of capital outlay was funded um, by OPER, and that's how we were able to reduce the FY23 budget. Uh, this is just a list of the capital outlay projects, just for your reference. Now, the rolling stock is uh, another policy that we have in the appendix in your budget book um, and also in the CIP is a, is a nice inventory of all of our equipment and uh, vehicles and a rollout policy so that we can maintain and uh, keep, keep the rolling stock um, uh, level funded pretty much or, or uh, I don't know what I say, keep the maintenance costs down and uh, keep our vehicles up to, up to snuff. Uh, during the FY23 budget deliberations here, um, the police used $187,600 from ARPA and the fire $196,000 from ARPA. So as you'll see in FY23, we had uh, $601,000 in the request right now. And again, this is the request. It needs to uh, go through and work with the city manager um, before we put together the final proposed budget. Information technology, um, as, as we mentioned, we're, we're ramping up uh, the IT department for necessary needs um, of upgrades and replacements. Um, also in FY23, we used $250,000 um, from the opera funding for IT replacement. So the request right now is at $1.6 million. So when we talk about using the opera funds, we um, 
put this table in here in the presentation so that you can uh, see that uh, we still have a, um, a list of projects that we utilized opera funds for. And we have a balance available that has been um, designated at this point of almost $5.4 million. Rockingham County. Um, so obviously this is a tax that we have to pay. Uh, the county's, um, the Rockingham County tax is based off of two factors. It's based off of what their adopted budget is. And then it's also proportioned throughout all 37 communities based on our equalized value. So even though we're like the fourth populous community of the 37, um, our values are higher than some of the other communities and our proportionment is right now 11.4%. Again, this is a number that we won't have um, determined until we get closer to setting the tax rate for 24. So what we anticipate uh, for FY24 is that um, FY23 we funded or uh, 5.7, we uh, budgeted 5.7 million dollars. The actual was 5.5 million dollars. So we're, we're recommending at this point until we know a little bit more is to not increase the budget of, from FY23. So with the proposed non-operating preliminary budget projections shows as, as this and these are um, the topics that we talked about in overall uh, seeing an increase of $185,000 or 0.71%. Now, the other non-operating line that's here, the decrease of the 1.2, those were certain supplemental appropriations that uh, took place in FY23 uh, that we will not be using in, in or have to budget for in FY24. So it, it shows as a decrease. So that kind of wraps up. We don't have a combined total. Um, as I talked about, the individual departments gave you some ideas of what they're looking at as an impact. So thank you, Judy, and, and as a bit of a recap, um, uh, Councillor Tabor, we, we, we took to heart your motion, um, we spoke to the trends, we, we share what the budget drivers that we know to be true at this point, um, we can consider potential tax impacts such as that 61% uh, offset that was achieved last year by the adequate education and the New Hampshire retirement contribution, and um, what we will do now is take the guidance we hear tonight. Uh, work that into the department head budgets, which are formally submitted to Judy and to me by the middle of February. And then we have, um, and those will come on the heels of the public hearings in that second week in February. And then what we will do is um, put, take, take your guidance, put it to work in our budgets. And um, the one thing I did want to mention is that we did not take into account any additional con considerations of the ARPA money aside from moving two small items out of capital outlay um, and, and suggesting use of ARPA, which were the cardiac monitors for the fire and uh, the library courtyard. Those are small dollars, less than 50 grand total, I believe. Um, so the idea is what still remains to be determined is how to allocate that remaining 5.382 million in ARPA money, which has to be obligated by the end of calendar year 24 and spent by the end of calendar year 26. Uh, so we will pause there and take questions, comments, anything you'd like to give us. Before, I guess I have a quick question on uh, the health insurance policy. Um, what, uh, I guess, uh, what have you shared with the city manager about uh, different paths to go? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think it would be helpful for always helpful for the council but uh, helpful the folks watching at home explaining the difference between the health insurance that we provide as a city and how maybe somebody that's getting health insurance through an employer uh, would understand kind of premiums and deductibles how we have to think about and allocate for that is that doable um, well so we are self-insured but it's managed through um, a third party, which is Health Trust. So they establish those rates. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Is that helpful? Would that be helpful? Might be helpful. When you say self insured, what is that? So if somebody is not a small business owner, has no idea when they come into you know, uh, health insurance, they just get a, 
they're a W-2 employee and they, they, they get health insurance. They have no idea how their health insurance works at their company. Can you explain what uh, self-insured means from, a, uh, I guess, a health plan? Okay, I will try. <laughs> so, um, so we're all pooled. So we're we're called members of the health trust in school care. So it's across the the state of New Hampshire who wants to be a member of um, of a health trust who offers different plans, and we negotiate those plans through contract negotiations. They offer several plans, but in a in the union contracts, some of those are limited to to what we offer. Um, as Portsmouth is concerned. So um, those, all of those um, members are pulled together so that it helps reduce the premium rates uh, over across the board. Now when they established the rate and what they did this year is really overall their increases were 8% uh, overall all of their members. But for Portsmouth the increase um, because they go by our experience uh, the employee's experience, how often we use those plans, was that uh, came in at like a 3.6% guarantee maximum rate. Um, the deductibles are, are built into the to the plans themselves, and what is selected through the negotiations. I think if I can add to this, what's concerning to Judy and to me is the the continued um, deficit, particularly correct. in the school side, and we yes. want to correct that. Right. So the policy. Um, you know, was has been in place for a number of years, and it worked really well um, when we first implemented it. But we we do need to change because um, we've had increases in FTEs, and um, and we built it off a of budget over budget over budget, and not really taking consideration the actual cost. We do we do estimate the actual cost, which is on that sheet. And what we anticipate, but the costs of for each department can shift dramatically each time. So if there's a qualifying event that someone gets married, say now they're picking up a family plan, which is much more expensive than when they were single. So um, it 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 can vary over um, over the fiscal year. If we have lots of vacancies, typically we have a surplus, and that's how we replenish that reserve. Um, in the stabilization fund. So we've been able to sustain it for a period of time. What happened, um, the, especially with the school department, is a little bit behind, quite a bit behind, over time. And that is because they were once on health trust, switched to school care. School care's premiums were low um, at one time. Um, but we still maintain that 10-year rolling average on the health trust on a budgetary standpoint, and then they had changes in FTEs. So we, we need to kind of analyze and cost out and <clears throat> try and come up with some other kind of policy. As I mentioned, we um, took a benefit from the um, holiday premiums, uh, but those are going to start dwindling away. Well, we'll get little bits, you know, depending on how they, um, and their fiscal year. I think it's worth noting, well, I asked Judy the question, isn't it as easy as moving all the people in school care back into health trust? And it's not so easy because it's a matter of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. um, and I should also mention that when we budget for this, we budget most conservatively to assume that every new hire taking insurance takes a family plan. Right. So if, if that isn't the case, then we benefit, but we, we do budget for that. And so I'm always a little slow on these things. So the just the difference between um, a uh, a self-funded uh, versus a, you know, like if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield. In a self-funded environment, the city is assuming the liability for all health care costs related to the employees that we, we serve, correct? And it's managed through it's health trust, and that's how we get our, our rates down. Kelly Harper is nodding yes. So. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Board so, of Judy. All right. And so, yeah, and, and this is kind of unfair because it's Kelly's, but I guess this sets up my, my next question. This is... You know, I would definitely support looking at the policy differences in terms of, you know, one lever of government to figure out how we can lower our exposure and, and right size this. The other thing I would love to see, and I don't know if this is a part of collective bargaining, but since we are in charge of every health, you know, every uh, health uh, issue for the city of Portsmouth employees, if we could figure out um, 
other uh, ways uh, to enable um, uh, cost savings through, um, you know, it could be, there's a lot of, since COVID, direct primary care where it's easy just to, you know, uh, text a, a you know a doctor, and you don't want people not using healthcare mm -hmm. because then it, it builds up into higher costs uh, longer down the road. But to explore ways that if we could spend money on um, increased programs that we would expect to have healthier employees because of that to lower healthcare costs. The example that I would use, and I don't know if we have any data from it, but the fire department. Uh, right. went through a you know a health and, and fitness program it wouldn't have to be health and fitness that relates to their activity but mm -hmm. you know being able to make sure that people have very easy access to doctors so they don't turn into uh, emergency situations because mm -hmm. you know the data two kids I know it's not always super easy to get into our primary care so sometimes we go to urgent care I know the cost may be higher for that than the primary care so looking at the options outside of simply Mm -hmm. uh, our policy when it comes to that and that's probably a Kelly Harper question but um, to lower um, our, our total cost and make sure our, our employees are as healthy as, as possible and they do offer um, different programs they have wellness programs um, and Kelly can you know by far speak um, to this subject um, they also offer employees or encourage employees to do what they call a, a shopper so if you need a certain procedure you go on to their to their health trust uh, website and you know and they encourage you to take uh, go somewhere where it costs less money so there are mechanisms where they are trying to uh, reduce that cost one of part of our premiums also include our retirees so once you retire you can stay on the city's plan the retirees pay 100 percent of that plan but it's called an implicit rate so b that blended experience includes the retirees and um, so their experience is built in to the active employees or the newer employees that may be younger and not need the health care so our premiums are, are slightly higher the active employees um, as a result of the you know the whole pool and um, with their retirees thank you Councilor Cook um, I just had a question around um, utilization of health insurance and um, not utilization utilization of health care but how many of our employees seem to take our health insurance versus um, a, an alternative option um, mm -hmm. say through a spouse and is there a way to um, I know that some employers have uh, different policies if you have the option to take a second type of insurance Yes, so we do offer through collective bargaining, and it's different from each union, that if you do not take the city's health insurance and you have health insurance, say, from a spouse, uh, that you get a health insurance stipend. That stipend varies um, within the different unions. Um, it saves the city money because that stipend is, you know, less than the cost of the premium, um, and it, it gives them an incentive, but we have to make sure that they're covered. Um, and I would say predominantly um, the employees are on our plans and um, but you can get those yeah I don't have the exact number. okay all right thank you Councilor Tabor and Councilor Newton. thanks mayor um, thank you uh, Judy and city manager uh, Connard for looking at some of the big drivers um, and I wanted to go to that page um, so did I hear you to say the school budget has been presented at 3.9 percent? Yes, they um, have had their public hearing and they have submitted their budget um, out in public, and they're they're coming in right now at 3.99 percent. Okay, and um, fire department at one percent. Well, speaking with the, the chief, um, I know he's been working with the commissions, and they're, they're trying really hard to, to keep it um, um, with very minimal increase. So they're shifting yeah. things around, but they haven't had their public hearing yet. Right. So then we get to general government, and we do have, as you say, some delayed hires. Mm -hmm. So we'll cycle through. We'll have 12 months for those, as opposed to six months. Correct. Mm -hmm. 
and we've got some departmental needs and FDEs that um, are going to be coming forward for us to consider. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at your page in the yes, last year's mm -hmm. budget where you you do a forecast out mm -hmm. through FY 24, 25, 26, just based on trends. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not underpinned by real data, it's just trends. Right. But the general government's been running at a 4% roughly and mm -hmm. it's 4.2 it looks like. Are we, do you think we're fall, we're going to come? I think the biggest challenge this year is um, the information technology uh, department. We've been uh, slowly increasing. It's, it's very, very necessary. It is to safeguard, you know, all of our systems. And sure, let me jump in. Sure. So with the benefit of our CIO having joined us and her coming right up to speed with what we know, one of the, the, the primary ask for, for body count would be for two people to take the place of our outside managed service provider, which is uh, Nesset right now. So the idea would be we would save, um, I don't have the numbers on me, but um, essentially a little less than half of what we pay an outside um, managed service provider contract fees by bringing two additional people in-house. And again, that's based on Pat's um, knowledge of, of what we have, what we need, and what we need, and a, and a reasonable expectation of how we can get there um, by still, you know, being cogent and cognizant of um, budgetary constraints. But to, to bring on the two people she's requested means um, a savings in, in real dollars and um, brings in the protection that we previously had outside. Right, and that's a, you know, I think the question really is, will we deliver better services for all our city departments by doing that? And, and I think there's been a fair case made so far last year, and, and we'll hear that case again. Um, the uh, <coughs> so the fire is is being very thrifty, and school is um, about in their typical range. We may have. Um, one time, we, we, we may need to step up our IT spending, um, and we have 12 month positions in general government that go up from six months. So maybe that is a little more than the 4.2%. But the big thing we got to overcome is, we're, is the 3.9 million of state revenue that was one time. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So that. <coughs> but don't forget, this time last year, we didn't know about either one of those. Right. So. Um, there could be many things that come across our radar that, to the good or the bad, that can impact <laughs> the money that um, we're talking right. about. And we haven't really um, talked about revenues in this presentation, just basically the loss of revenues. So we have some work to do there, too. Right, right. And historically, you know, uh, there's some, we get some one or Two percent increase in our tax base just from new construction, and mm -hmm. that's without revaluing. Right. But just right. So that will help. Right. Um, which could help offset the loss of some of that state tax revenue. Um, last question would be around FTEs. Um, we came into last year's budget looking at an increase of. 27. I think we trimmed that down to 23. Um, how are we doing filling those 23? And um, <clears throat> are they all filled? That's a really good question. Um, the answer is, uh, I can tell you the one that's closest to me is physically in my office is still not filled. That was one of the delayed hires, the digital communication specialist. Um, I think the police is still trying to fill a couple. Karen is nodding. Chief is right here. Other than that, we have filled them. Okay. Right. Um, so we're not going into this year with more than four or five known vacant positions. Or Absolutely not. Right. Yeah. Um, the I'll give you an example. Recreations up here. 
um, the two asks there are one would be a recreation supervisor uh, because we've taken on a whole new um, facility at community campus and um, the second ask of recreation is a full-time lifeguard because as you know we've been challenged with our ability to operate the indoor pool because you need two lifeguards there at all times and um, it's hard to rely upon with part-time help so was if we have a second <laughs> full-time lifeguard at the indoor pool we can maintain regular hours so I was there this morning for my 745 swim and we had, had to, to wait, wait. <laughs> you had to wait 15 minutes I think right um, <clears throat> and can you tell us some of the uh, positions that we might be adding considering to add uh, for the delivery of better service so um, the the two there are two positions listed up in information technology one is an engineer and one is a project manager uh, in planning we are looking to memorialize um, someone that we brought on in a contractual relationship um, that is associate environmental planner Kate Homey she will um, count as a new FTE in this budget although she's been working in planning um, legal is looking to add a staff attorney they are um, completely overwhelmed with work and um, Susan can speak to that if you'd like but that's the, the that is a, a, a lower level staff attorney to help um, catch up and mentioned recreation um, and finance would be um, in the in the line of um, leadership and succession planning for when um, when Judy decides to leave we need to bring on um, some expertise with with plenty of overlap uh, and we have not determined anything but the idea is um, um, that would be uh, a smart thing to do if she leaves within the next 12 to 18 months okay so we're looking at four to five FTEs in general government uh, that you'll be coming to ask us about um, we look forward to hearing the case for those one we haven't mentioned it's coming out of the water budget is a water quality specialist which uh, speaks to our compliance issues with uh, federal and state regulations. And if we could just make an ask, when we say that we will say, like it's a net savings, are we including um, benefits and? Uh, we are. We are. We do calculate that, yes. Okay. Councilor Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's more a comment versus a question. But when going back to the conversation on health care and collective bargaining, the focus of most negotiations during COVID has understandably been retention and uh, due to the great resignation. However, pre-COVID, one of the biggest things prior councils had focused on was just that, our share of the health care costs. And the reason for that is pretty obvious, that personnel costs is the biggest um, cost that the city has because we don't produce anything, and the increase in health care was the biggest driver in increases. So what we were talking about potentially doing in the future for collective bargaining agreements, pursuing um, a better share for the people when it comes to health care costs, that used to be the largest driver. Thank you, Councilor Denton. Any other questions? We'll open it up to the public comment. Thank you, City Manager and Judy Belanger and Andrew. Um, yep. Anybody that wants to come up to the mic, please do so. Just state your name, um, City of Residence, and Mr. Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. Um, I want to thank everyone for sitting through and putting this budget together. I am glad to hear where the city manager is coming from. I guess I'm waiting to hear where the council is coming from on the budget. Um, you know, uh, first of all, Health Trust has given, I'm assuming they've given, because they've given most of us what ultimately we're going to have to pay. So we know what that rate is. Um, in years going, I, I know that sometimes that wasn't as good um, many years ago, but they've really worked and stepped up. So you know what your maximum is going to be. So I would encourage you to look at that health insurance line. Um, 
<clears throat> I also want to think about putting something in for the police officers to have um, a social worker. I appreciate that. But I also want to know why we need a new attorney. I have said over the years that the school district has an attorney in there for, in particular, for special needs. Um, I don't many, know many cities of our size that have that. Um, so I really question that role. And I guess I would have to question if we're having so many out of district placements and what are we doing in our schools? So I, especially with um, having the capability of having a placement like the Lister Circle for students with um, behavior issues. So I would ask that you look at that a little bit closer. Um, my other concern is having an all day budget. Don't get me wrong, I, I think that's a great idea. We did it, but we did it on a Saturday. And we did have people from the public show up. So I guess I'm a little questioning doing it on a Monday. So I would hope that you would rethink that maybe and do it on a, on a Saturday so the public that works can attend. <laughs> Lastly, um, I would ask you to think about uh, new positions at this time and really make sure that you have vetted that position. Um, I know this year and, and past year, something we've done really well at, in the district, and this is my second round of budgets in the last couple weeks, um, is really look at retirements. And is that need, those people retiring, are they st that position still needed? And I can tell you in, as a school personnel, that is something we look at and take seriously. Um, and over the years we have been able to because our school population everywhere in the state is going down. And we've been able to really evaluate each position and maybe it becomes a different position. So in other words, maybe you have positions that people are retiring from and as a council you evaluate that and see if that's some money you can move to a different position. So I would encourage you to look at that. Um, and lastly, I think that um, I heard the other night when they were talking about water and sewer on the CIP that it's not a tax. Um, well, it is. It's just not in the general fund. So remember that not only are people looking at their tax rates here and how much they're going to go up, and it has gone up as this council, um, but also their water and sewer rates, which have gone up extreme and per some information I've been given are the highest in the state. So I would ask that you really look at both and consider it as one big, the, how much the citizen is paying and not just look at the tax rate, but let's look at the whole package. Thank you for your time and good luck. Thank you, Esther. Good evening, Petra Huda, 280 South Street. Um, since this is the first time we've seen anything, um, I do have a couple of questions or considerations for you to think about. Um, biggest thing is on the last page, the non-operating preliminary budget projections. Um, the first one, debt service, uh, we're down almost 700,000. So my question is, um, since we just put the Pierce Island plant over on the State Revolving Fund and we had two bond offerings in the last year or two, um, I, I, I'm trying to understand why we're going down there. Uh, the next one is rolling stock. We're going up 110% basically. So um, that would be a big question in my mind. What, what are we actually requesting here? Uh, I understand the, uh, the IT replacement and um, on the statement that was made with the new CIO coming in, uh, if we are going to look at replacing uh, staff with, or consultants with staff, it would be great for everybody to see um, a cost benefit analysis on that and how much we would be saving uh, if we were gonna do that going forward. Because, I mean, the, the things you have to look at it, when you have a contractor, you don't pay benefits. 
and when you bring somebody on board, um, the benefits from my past experience, maybe 30, 40 percent of their salary. So there is a, a large expenditure there to also consider. Uh, next, uh, the same thing with capital outlay. I noticed you uh, had some uh, items coming out of ARPA funds. So I would ask that we consider the ARPA funds again when we are looking at capital for this year, um, not knowing what the restrictions are, um, just a consideration that I would ask you to look at. And the other thing that caught my eye was in the retirement system uh, in the in I don't know what page it's on but uh, you had a decrease of 37 million from 21 to 22 mm -hmm. which is a, a very large number and it would be a very large number for um, the city to absorb on that so uh, I guess I would ask uh, what kind of uh, analysis we're doing on that and you know please please be careful there with the liability thank you Thank you, Petra. <coughs> Any other speakers? Any on Zoom? No. Well, uh, thank you, uh, City Manager. Thank you for all the, uh, the work that went into this and, and everybody that, that uh, came forth. We owe you some. Um, some guidance uh, around this that expect us to do that at the next council meeting um, you know I uh, employees we love all the employees that um, we have we want to make sure that their jobs are uh, done effectively sometimes it means uh, adding team members but the conversation around adding those team members is going to be a um, not only on the cost benefit analysis but you know how do we uh, use the efficiencies that we grow with government to uh, to make sure that we can do that obviously when we have new buildings it's tough to be in two places uh, at once uh, and that should always be a, um, a lesson for us when we, when we talk about acquiring uh, facilities they don't man themselves so um, look forward to that conversation um, and look forward to uh, everybody that's going to come in over the next couple of months I'll remember uh, to keep our, um, our, our, uh, our public hearing open this time uh, so we don't have to reopen it um, and uh, look forward to the discussion that uh, that we'll all have together good night Portsmouth thank you